Uh, at this time, I will turn it over to Ms. Nikki Dennis. To you, Dr. Jason Atkinson, solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States, so help you God. To you, Dr. Jason Atkinson, further solemnly and sincerely swear that you will be faithful and bear allegiance to the state of North Carolina and to the constitutional powers and authorities, which are or may be established for the government thereof, that you will endeavor to support, maintain, and defend the Constitution of said state, not inconsistent with the Constitution of the United States, to the best of your knowledge and abilities, so help you God. I do. You, Dr. Jason Atkinson, further swear that you will well and truly execute the duties of office of the superintendent of Bladen County Schools, according to the best of your skill and ability, according to law, so help you God. I do. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing that for us, Miss Nikki Dennis. Yes, sir. Taking time out of your busy schedule. No problem. I appreciate this. It's an honor to be here. I thank you. Thank you very much. And again, we'll congratulate you, Dr. Atkinson, and uh, we're here to support you. And uh, we think that uh, so far you've been doing a fantastic job from what I hear. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. I, again, I appreciate the board's confidence in me fill this position. And uh, we'll, we'll work together to uh, collaborate and do what's best for Blake County School. Thank you so very much. Hi. I really appreciate you watching this video. I wanted to give you some background of what happened at the meeting last night. Prior to the meeting, I went. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Charlotte Smith with Blade Online. I appreciate you watching. Just wanted to give you a little background about what happened at the meeting last night. I went to cover the meeting in person because the agenda said that the meeting would be held in person and virtually. So I thought this was great because I had some questions our readers have been asking us about the social study standards and about a lawsuit that the school has um, on the agenda and also about the budget. So the pro projected budget. So I went to the meeting and started setting up in the meeting room. Just a couple minutes before the meeting started, a Bladen County Sheriff's deputy walked in the meeting room and asked me to gather all my stuff and to follow him. So I did, just as he asked, and I followed him, and he explained that he had been told to escort me out, that I was not allowed to be in the meeting, and that Mr. Smith, a Bladen County School's parent, who was there to address the board and was on the agenda, would not be allowed to attend the meeting either. I asked him to call the Bladen County Sheriff, Mr. Jim McVicker, and he did. According to the Bladen County Sher uh, Sheriff's deputy, he, the sheriff said that I was not to be arrested, but that if the Bladen County Schools or Bladen County Board of Education would like anyone removed, they would have to contact the magistrate's office and uh, take out a warrant for an arrest. However, by this time, Dr. Atkinson was taking his oath. If I would have walked in, I would have been disruptive. So I didn't. And so I just wanted to let you know what happened. Now, Mr. Smith did still get to address the Board of Education and you'll hear what he has to say along with some more information. Um, further information about the meeting and what was decided at the meeting may be found at bladenonline.com. Thank you for watching. Uh, I don't think we have any spotlight or recognition for tonight, any citizen participation. Yes, sir. Uh, we do have uh, Mr. Dan Smith. He's actually here tonight uh, for citizen participation. Can. This looks a lot like an in-person meeting. Is that accurate? 
It is. Yes. It is. It was publicized as such. Is that right? That's correct. But you're not allowing anyone in here. I can uh, come and see it, and the media can't come in here. Is that is that accurate? <clears throat> we are following the guidelines by the state, and this is how we have to do in order to be able to hold this meeting. So uh, we're giving you your time. Okay. Well, I would like for it to be duly noted that if you're going to post and publicize an in-person meeting and disallow the media to come in and disallow me to hear the remainder of the meeting, that is certainly a violation of rights for certain. It's duly noted. Duly noted. All right. I do appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Over the past year, I've been both complimentary and critical of this board's actions and, in some cases, the lack of action by this board. I find it unacceptable that the public has been completely isolated and as is made evident here now uh, from this board, from your presence, and that my questions that I've sent to this board have gone completely unanswered. So I'm going to address some of those same questions today. Statistically, every customer com for every customer complaint, there's 26 other unhappy customers who remain silent. This Board of Education has a number of unhappy customers. Other Bolivian County parents have also voiced concerns to board members, and it makes me wonder how many are indeed remaining silent. I've had others reach out to me about concerns. Recently, someone sent me a mail correspondence with no return information and no explanation as to whom or to where it was from. In said envelope was a document from the North Carolina DPI licensure search in reference to Dr. Atkins. It states that Dr. Atkins is licensed for music, K-12, and institutional technology specialist computers. I thought this was odd. Why would someone send this to me? I didn't, truthfully, I had no idea that there was a licensing board for that. So I conducted my own search and found the same, um, and that was made effective in the summer of last year according to the BPI website. So I searched, it was easy to do, uh, so I searched several other folks. The first one I searched was Dr. Taylor to see what his uh, licensure was for. And it wasn't as as follows. Exceptional Children's Program Administrator, Social Studies 6 through 9, School Administrator Principal, Social Studies 9 through 12, and lastly, School Administrator Superintendent. After this, I searched several of the other local principals and found them licensed, much the same as Dr. Taylor. I stated in my last letter at the last uh, virtual meeting, uh, I think we should call this a virtual meeting, that uh, maybe Dr. X is the best candidate. I don't know. I don't feel any of you could say that with any certainty either, as it appears that no one else was considered. Truthfully, it's most likely that there were several violations in this hiring, but that's been done. So could we, the parents of the district, get a commitment from this board to be more thorough, maybe take a little more time, maybe even select a subcommittee, and by all means be more transparent moving forward? I'll take that as a maybe. I'd like to address Dr. X. I don't feel that you've been treated fairly in all of this, really. And I don't have anything, I don't know you personally, I don't, I don't have anything negative at all. Um, unfortunately, the manner in which you were selected is suspect. And I hate that for you, I really do. Um, because it'll be something that's going to be hard to overcome. Truthfully, I, I hope and pray that it'll make you. Uh, better the, the, the controversy is trying to make it better. Uh, but I, remember, I do hope and pray that you commit to the children's community in the acceptance of substandard learning for all students. And I'd like you to ask you to commit to pushing this board to be better and hope that you would recommend subcommittees when needed and encourage community involvement. That's something that's been just completely left out. It's your, your biggest asset of the thousands of parents in the community, and you just don't consult. It's, it's, it's irrelevant. I feel irrelevant. I do. So. And I'm an active parent. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm listening to your meetings, and I'm doing this and doing that, and I'm sending emails, and I feel completely isolated and irrelevant to you, to the board. And that's just not the way it's supposed to be. So we need the board to create opportunities for parent involvement and to seek parent input at a high level, not just for the sake of doing so, and to do so with an open mind. 
It's no small task, but the future of our community truly depends on you, sir. On another note, board members, it's time for us to stop complaining about charter schools and start competing against them. If teachers make competitive wages and the children are being educated adequately under the traditional public school platform, there certainly wouldn't be a market for charter schools in our community. I don't think anybody could disagree with that. People don't leave public school says we go to charter schools just for the sake of doing it. I mean, it's not, it's less convenient. Uh, every time a student or teacher moves out of this public school system into a charter, in my opinion, it's a direct reflection of the poor education and poor conditions that they were in in the public school system, which goes right back around this board for the people in this room. I'm glad to see that you're proposing a pay increase to teachers and your proposal to the county commissioners. But I noticed going off the budget proposal draft, it appears that, uh, and I don't, there's obviously a lot of gray here, but it appears that the line item for supplement teacher is about a 4% increase, while the salary superintendent is probably 11% increase. Which I thought was suspect as well. But school board is ultimately responsible for our students and teachers. Um, excuse me, I lost my train of thought. What programs are you implementing to offer better education opportunities for our students? And will you commit to improving the quality of education in our community? And then lastly, as I mentioned in my last letter, the state has adopted a new social studies curriculum. Might not be important to some folks, but it's really important to me. And I think it's important to other people in the community. And unfortunately, I don't feel this board had any input in it. If they did, I don't know about it. And maybe it's just that there was no transparency. Maybe you all thought a lot about it, send a lot of information to the state. But if you did, I'd encourage you to let the parents know. But in my mind, that's what this board is for. You know what I'm saying? We, we should be on the top of the list, not the bottom. We shouldn't be just accepting what's done. We need to be a, talk, we need to be a part of the conversation. I don't feel like this board is part of the conversation at the state level at all. Uh, this board, uh, have you reviewed the social studies curriculum, the new social studies curriculum? Has this board seen that curriculum? I'll take that as a matter. Did this board recommend any suggestions on that uh, curriculum? Did we make a recommendation from this board to the state on whether or not to accept that curriculum that state? Is that, I mean, is that a normal thing to do? I don't, I would think so. And if it's not, it should be. And we should be leading the way in doing that. Have you asked the parents what they thought about new standards? I can answer that. Was there any public comment on this? Certainly not. We do need new standards. There's a lot of changes that need to be made. And I feel like I've been nothing but critical, but it's not because I'm mad at you or upset with you. It's because we tell our kids, I tell my I'm tough on you because I, I know what you're capable of, and so we shouldn't expect any less than that. And that, should that be the case for all of us? If we're capable of this, then, we should, then, then I, you should expect that from me, and I should expect that from you. And I still feel that's what we've been getting from school in the past 12 months, for sure, at least the past 12 months. So um, it's discouraging, it really is. And, I, I think all the answers are in this room. I really do. But it's not going to be we close doors and lock gates in virtual meetings. That's not going to get this done. It's not going to be with no parent involvement. It's not going to be with unresponses to emails. It's not going to be with me asking questions and never get an answer. I think, I mean, that's not acceptable. If I send you a question, why can't we get an answer? If you ask me a question, I'm going to get you an answer, and you would expect that from me. And I think that I should be able to expect that from you all. That's it. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, our consent agenda has passed. At this time, uh, we'll move to action items, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Harrison. Good evening, again. Okay, our first item is the budget projection to the county commissioners. This is the budget that we do each year that 
is um, our proposal to the county commissioners based on just projections because we still don't have everything and we don't know exactly what's going to take place across the state because no um, um, budgets have been passed. We're in long sessions, so we're still waiting on how we make our next step. So the way that I, um, and you'll see on your little memo that I attached to the front, the way that I projected this budget was um, based pretty much on what they're telling us as far as the governor's budget, which is, as we all know, we don't know whether that'll pass or not, which is a 7.5% increase on salaries, 1.5% on retirement, 1.5% on hospitalization. And I do want to um, just clarify, because I know you're probably thinking, according to um, what was stated just a few minutes ago, that is not a difference. Um, if you look at the superintendent's salary on here, you're only looking at you're looking at hospitalization, retirement, social security, and salary. When you're looking at supplements, you're only looking at the percentage of the increase of teacher pay at 7.5%, which doesn't include the hospitalization and health benefits. So that's the difference in what um, he was saying with 11 thousand dollar or eleven percent in the four and a half percent I think way said. Um so I just want to um, make sure that you're aware of that. The only increase in this budget that you're seeing projected right here is the benefits and the salary. And you know we don't pay teacher salaries out of um, local funds. That's only administrative funds and you'll see as you go through what the um, budget was for the 21 2021 year versus what the proposal is for the 21 22 year. We had Dr. Atkinson and myself met with um, the Finance Committee for the board, and then we met with um, Mr. Greg Martin and Lisa, the Finance Officer, and um, the board chair for the county commissioners. We talked with them about um, not asking for increases this year. We know that we are getting extra funds that can be used for COVID-related issues, and we know that um, with the new school and all that is coming up, we felt like as far as we may going through the budget that we didn't need to um, increase that. Our debt with the two high schools will be paid. So um, we're looking at all of those things together. So when we present this to them with the superintendent's um, message that we'll have to present to them for their May 3rd meeting, um, that's what that statement will say, and this will be attached to that. So what you're approving tonight is just the projected budget for us to um, submit to the county commissioners. This is not the exact budget that we will use for our 21-22 school year. So if there's any questions, I'll be glad to answer those. If there's not any questions. Um, I have a question. Is this something new? No, sir. I think Ms. Kenny did this every year in May. We had to have this done before. We are we have to have a budget approved, a projected budget, so that we can present to the county commissioners in May, so that they can approve us for the 21-22 school year. Mr. Rudd, we do this every year about this time. And there's no other questions. So we're asking for two thirteen, but you're saying we're probably it probably more in line with what twenty twenty one was. That's exactly right. Okay. When we did this budget with Dr. Atkinson and I talked about doing this budget, we wanted him to see what our increases would be if they were based on this. Because with the ESSER funds, um, those will be COVID related mm -hmm. things. But we know that with the building, two high schools being paid off and all that stuff, that we didn't feel like we just needed to go in and ask for a lot of money whenever we really felt like we were. Yeah, have they made a decision about that money that we were paying? You know, are, we, are we going to be allowed to keep it or are they going to take it back? Or they... We're waiting on an answer for that. Okay. We have um, spoken to them, requested, and um, they told us that when we present our budget, our budget message, then we should receive a letter back. Yeah. So that's where we're standing with that. And that payment is due. That payment June is due. Yeah. That's our last payment. We have stressed to them. <laughs> time and time again. Yeah. Uh, this might not be appropriate this time, but uh, the question about Captain Alley and I know we get the new high school.
school built. I met the new K school built. But yet still, we still got some concerns about our fear houses and things of this nature. Mm-hmm. They'll be addressed it later, so we have a clear understanding of it. Yes, sir. We're, we're still in discussions with that also. So we will have some guidance on that. Mr. Rosers, I hope that that money that came back from the dead or time we can direct toward those larger cattle outlay requests, such as those projects. So that's what we're, we stress to them that it would be good for us to core with we had opportunity this bus to come back we can direct those toward those other projects that we were looking at doing most purpose buildings and potential good houses um before we have any more questions uh we need to get a motion on the floor um we have a motion to uh, approve uh the 21 22 uh projected budget to be uh Presented to the commissioners on their motion. Motion to approve. Go ahead. Okay. I have a motion by Mr. Glenn McCoy and a second by Mr. Allen West. Um, at this time, is there any more discussion? If not, I yield to you, Ms. Valerie. As I call your name, please indicate your vote. Chris Clark. Uh, Dennis Edwards. Uh, Tim Benton. Aye. Gary Voda. Aye. Instant Rocher. Aye. Corey Singletary. Aye. Alan West. Aye. Glenn McCoy. Aye. Roger Carroll. Aye. Mr. Chairman, you have nine yeses. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Harrison. You have a projected budget to get to the county commissioners and at this time we'll turn it back over to you again. okay the next item is our banking rfp on february the 9th we sent out a request for proposal for banking services to my recollection i would look back and back and back to see how far i could go back but this has not been done in many many years we have been with wells fargo for not many years we sent the rfp out to all our local banks we advertised it in the Lady journal on Lane County Schools website. Um, we received back four proposals from four different banks. And you should have a rubric in your um, board docs that goes through each bank and what we based each um, question on as far as, and you know, most of the time, banking services are pretty much the same across the board. Most banks offer digital banking, most banks offer um, the um, bank statements in hand or out of hand they offer your supplies but going through um the differences and the biggest differences of course to me is the money side so right now we are paying anywhere from 1100 to 1400 dollars a month in service charges which was a big red flag to me um and my understanding by talking with the ladies and finances has just grown over the years so um, when I looked at the service charges for the four banks, bb t came in at the lowest, about $302 a month approximately. And we were, each one of the banks I was given a budget analysis so they could exactly look at exactly what we have now and compare to exactly the services they have. So it was apples to apples. So they would know exactly what we were looking at. The other um, big thing to me was the banking supplies. Um, we had two banks that charged standard pricing for banking supplies. And when I say banking supplies, I'm talking about deposit bags, night deposit um, bags, um, deposit slips, those types of things that can be expensive when you start adding them up. We had two banks that start that charge standard pricing. One bank provided the services. The, the service charges were extremely high. And then um, bb would provide these services at no cost to us also. So um, the administration is asking for the approval of bank services to begin on July 1st with bb or Truist. If you look in your um, rubric, you'll see the proposal from bb and and um, it says bb Truist. So if you see Truist, you'll know why. But we are asking for approval that as of July 1st that we will move our banking services to bb and Truist. You heard Miss. Harrison's uh, request. Can I have a motion? Motion to go to BBNT for banking. I have a motion and a second. A motion by 
Mr. Rozier, second by Mr. Tim Benton. Uh, any discussion? And would this be handled through Whitehall or it won't be handled through Elizabeth? The main office is the regional city in Whitehall, but, um, and that's who I've been working with. They were the ones who sent me, um, Mr. Evan Moore right. is the one who sent me the regional. <coughs> it actually is someone else that will handle the process of moving us through. Um, it's um, one of his assistants, and I cannot remember her name, but her name's in that. Um, so I mean, we make deposits or whatever. We we'll go to the one here in town. Or yes, we go to any branch and make deposits. Any big city, and we still would be able to also do remote deposits. So um, we can do actual check deposits from here. Any more discussion? I yield to you, Miss Valerie. As I call your name, please indicate your vote, Chris Clark. Uh, Dennis Edwards. Uh, Tim Benton. Uh, Gary Voda. Uh, Vincent Rozier. Uh, Corey Singletary. Uh, Alan West. Uh, Glenn McCoy. Uh, Roger Carroll. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you have nine yeses. Thank you very much. Um, we have switched the balance. Thank you so much. Uh, at this time, uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Beatty and Dr. Atkinson. In your packet, you should have received a copy of our 2021 enrichment plan. This is going to be a plan that is required by all LEAs to extend the instructional program for the year. This is only a draft, probably about 30 minutes ago, before we had the well, 30 minutes prior to the board meeting. Um, the state board finally approved the guidance that is coming out. So this is only to get us started. It just covers the main components. So you will see the purpose, the plan requirements, our tentative pay guidance. Then you will see um, any signing bonuses or performance bonuses that will be required for staff. We did want to indicate that hours may vary because of um, position and that some people will be getting an outright salary, whereas others will be getting a bonus because of the activities that will need to be covered during the summer program. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was reading. I, I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Beatty has gave us uh, her proposal for um, the summer school and, and reading cap. I need a motion to approve. A motion by Mr. Chris Clark to approve. Can I have a second? Second. I have a second by Mr. Vince Rozier. Any discussion? Did you need additional funds? Yes, sir. Uh, part of that answer package is we have to set aside a percentage directly for learning loss and summer programs. So we'll actually have some married funds from what the state provides for reading camp, uh, as well as uh, any extra funds, Title I. So uh, we're actually looking at parallel our reading camp, our camp all at the same time. So we really maximize our resources. And what we're looking back at looking at for this time frame was to a lot of districts are all over the place trying to figure out how to do either the 150 hours or 30 days we met the principals and uh our have a committee just worked on this as well uh and we felt like that we could target the four weeks five days a week and still preserve time in the summer for our teachers students employees and families to have some time before coming in the academic year some folks are going across almost the whole summer but we felt like we could do this and uh condense this and have the program completed uh if all things go well by july 2nd to preserve all july and all august for our folks to have summer break well, what I'm hearing is there's a concern from teachers going all day, five days a week after they've just gone through this whole year of virtual, in-person. I mean, it, basically, a lot of them are just completely burned out and don't want to even come back to school after the last year. Uh, and, we're, and, and, we, and we've got the work we there. One thing, we, and we went back and forth with this. Uh, the general consensus was look at this first again. This could be changed. The, the time frames could be different. Uh, so we got, you know, again, we'll kind of pull our folks, see, um, you know, obviously the, the employment that's voluntary. Uh, 
uh, we cannot count toward every retirement. They have to become temporary contracted employees for this particular purpose. Uh, so kind of, you know, um, seeing what we get back, we've also looked at the possibility of uh, some staff members that may want to divide up some work a couple of weeks. So that, that's some options. So we have a lot of flexibility to work in that to get those folks the time. So we've encouraged principals as we these applications in. I uh, want a number of students that would be invited to that kind of return. We kind of we have a little bit of flexibility on doing this. This is kind of our initial working plan at this point. The committee is going to meet again next Wednesday to work through that some more. And that the before and after school, when school returns, is that just completely out of the equation? Or? Well, uh, it's out of this legislation, but um, part of um, the work with the learning loss is there going to be part of that is how do you do supplemental services? Uh, even looking at potentially in the school day, could you bring in tutors to help with intervention? So we can look at some during the school day things as well as maybe after school, kind of what the 21st century program had done. Yeah. Um, be able to compensate, you know, teachers and uh, employees and all that work with it as well. So uh, this is just uh, this specific legislation is just for the summer, but that's a part of the expectation and part of our plan of rolling out uh, as a part of ESSER to address learning loss even to the school year. And I think the more we can address those interventions, have more hands on, that also help as teachers come back. If we can look at that, so. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of flexibility in this to address learning loss, so they want to get feedback from them on kind of things they would, what kind of resources they would need, what can we do to even help this as we go into these extra funds that support this. You've got extra three that goes through 2024, extra two that goes through 2023. So, um, you know, we we're able to kind of look long term. Uh, I see potentially this same kind of thing happening again next summer just to kind of address learning loss. Uh, but we will have some flexibility to do some things. Uh, at first, we thought they were going to let us take this time and divide it up, not just the summer, but also into the fall. Um, and that was something that was uh, pretty much we thought was going to be a guarantee. But when we got an interpretation back uh, from DPI and CASA, uh, they were um, specifying that it had to be in the summer. So that we were hoping to split the time and get maybe 75 to a maybe 100 hours in the summer because our summer reading camp legislation requires 75 hours. So we thought if we could parallel that, that would be good. But unfortunately, they put everything in the summer. That's what's difficult. And it's not just really us, but other districts are really struggling with availability of staff. That's why we tried to maybe see if we could condense it to free up that time. But I think it's important to maybe if you got two teachers that want to do it, they teach the same thing. Right. Maybe let them do half and the other one half. Right. Kind of good. So, yeah, we do have that flexibility. So, we're hoping that might actually help us and, you know, that way they can kind of plan that out. I just want to do some sketch. There may be a teacher out there, but I'd be surprised if there's a teacher that's going to go from 7 30 to 4 for four, four weeks right after you get out. So, exactly. It is very agitating. <laughs> but the pay is good. I it mean, is. The pay is really good. And that's something we were encouraged to do. We felt like we needed to do. You were asking folks to give up their summertime as a mandate, but. Uh, so all for this, that we compensate them accordingly. Uh, and we tried to make sure that a lot of folks were still kind of up in the air. We have a neighbor account that was looking at $50 an hour for teacher, which basically placed our, our $400 per day on that. So, you know, we're just trying to, to be fair to our folks uh, because they've given their time. One thing is, is and with the legislation, you offer the program. There's, you know, we'll have to do attendance and those kind of things. Uh, but, you know, parents have flexibility. So, for example, in a high school city setting, if someone wants to do credit recovery, they may only be going for four hours that day. So, you know, we even have some flexibility maybe in the day as well. So, okay. but, uh, definitely, um, uh, we want to treat our folks right who uh, are willing to work in this, in this program to help our students. Well, thank you. That's great. But are the students going to come? That's what we're hopeful for. And that was another thing, too, thinking about trying to get it. Uh, still give them a summer as well. Um, you know, so, and, and one thing that we're looking at doing is, you know, uh, the, the term summer school is there, but they really want you to market it much like a camp to make it fun and engage in and have some enrichment, physical activities, a requirement of the program as well. So, we work with our P teachers and, uh, you know, look at the arts and ways we can make it fun and exciting, but also address. Um, you know, the, the academic needs as, as well as social emotional needs. Do we have any students. indication yet of how many make them? Uh, we are, I've asked principals, we've sent them a spreadsheet to get into the identification of the at-risk students that are required to, or that uh, part of legislation. 
So we should know by next Tuesday, we've asked them to turn that in so that the committee can look at potentially how many students would, could come. And then we're going to send a letter to those families and give them a self address uh, stamp envelope to respond back. Yes, I want to participate or no, I did not. Uh, so that will give us a true accurate how many is going to be here. Um, but, you know, for planning purposes, we'll, we'll know next week kind of how many fall on that radar of being at risk. And this is strictly in person? It is in person. It's defined as in person. Yeah, um, that's filled out in legislation. So. Any other questions? I yield to you, Ms. Valerie.